Okay, so we're going to continue on with the scientific method. And this is a laid out format. We know it by Sir Francis Bacon. Um, it's a series of methodical steps that allow scientists to approach a problem and test aspects of it. There are two types of logic in general. There's inductive, which increases the scope of the final answer, and there's deductive, which decreases the scope to a specific case. Deductive logic is the type used in the scientific method. Now, a lot of people have some misconceptions about the scientific method. Um, one of the things is, how does it start? And everybody's like, well, question. Well, no, it's not. It's the observation, because all science starts with observation. If a phenomenon can't be observed, it can't be tested. Therefore, it's not a scientific question. Um, and so observations serve a lot of different purposes, but a lot of those purposes deal with what question am I actually investigating? Is it worthwhile? Can I test it? Etc. And so those are all important aspects to it. The second step is to create a hypothesis. A hypothesis is not and I'm going to say this multiple times, it is not an educated guess. You can't guess at something, you can't prove a hypothesis either, and that's the whole thing in science, is that science is constantly being tested. And hypotheses are testable explanations, not a guess, okay? When you were younger, they explained it as an educated guess, and you kind of got it, and you were like, oh yeah, okay. But it really isn't. It's not an educated guess. You're not a parrot, so don't act like one. Um, this is something that you have to test. If you can't test it, not a hypothesis or not a valid hypothesis. In beginning science classes, it's almost always posed as an if-then statement, which is a more formalized hypothesis. Experimental design is the, is the next step, and it must take into account different types of variables, control groups, and controlled conditions, which are also known as constants. The independent variable is the I changed it variable. It's the one that the experimenter, experimenter manipulates to see if it creates an effect. In some textbooks you'll see it as the manipulated variable. The dependent variable is the responding variable. It responds to changes that we've done to the independent variable. It's the one we're interested in finding out about. So in other words, if you're interested in measuring it, that's your dependent variable. The control group is one that serves as the comparison group, and it's the group in which the independent variable is not manipulated at all, or it's the one that most closely mimics a normal or natural situation, so that controls are for comparing them. Using controlled conditions or constants help to minimize variability between the groups so that you can see a true effect on the dependent variable if there is one. To give you an example, this is a research species I used to work with when I was doing work in physiology research. This is the white-footed mouse, or Paramiscus leucopus. The white-footed mouse is um, a wild mouse that occurs in a huge latitude range. And one of the things that we did to minimize the variables was we used them only at a certain age. Um, we used only males so that we didn't have to deal with fluctuating hormone levels. Um, we used... Uh, the males were grow were raised in a specific light structure because we were actually looking at seasons affecting uh, these mice. And so we kept all of those things as constant as possible to minimize the variability between the groups so we could see if there was a true um, result or not. Once you've done your experiment or experiments, you do um, a data collection. Data can be qualitative like color, you know, what color is it? Um, or it can be quantitative, which is numeric. Many times, even if you're doing a qualitative scale, you ch change it into a quantitative scale so that it's easier to work with. Finally, after you've collected your data, you make conclusions, and conclusions are based on that data analysis. If you don't show your data, you can't make a conclusion, it's like you just pulled it out of your ear. You must always refer to your hypothesis in your conclusion. You can either support or reject a hypothesis, but you can never, ever, 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 ever put underlines, happy faces, smileys, rainbows, and stars next to it. You can never prove a hypothesis. You can only support it. And then here comes the really sticky wicket, the theory versus the law. 
A theory is a hypothesis that has been supported by dozens if not hundreds or thousands of experiments for a period of no fewer than 50 years. Okay, I'm going to say that again. It's a hypothesis that has been supported in multiple fields for no less than 50 years through multiple experimentation. Remember, the first time we get a rejection for a hypothesis, you have to throw it out and start over. So the first time under normal conditions, if I drop a ball and it falls up, well, we got to throw out gravity. Um, so that's one of those things that, you know, people misconstrue the term theory because to normal people walking up and down the street, if you said, I have a theory that, you know, I have a theory that Michael Jackson is going to be made a saint since he died. Well, I really don't, but let's just say I did. Um, that's a layperson's theory, not a scientist's theory. A scientist theory is multiple hypothesis support over many, many, many years. If it's been hanging around for a lot longer than that, and very few do, but if it's been hanging out for more than 200 years, it becomes a law. It's been consistently supported for more than 200 years through many, many tests in multiple environments and fields of study. And as far as this cartoon is concerned, um, you know, evolution has been supported multiple times. And it is one of those scientific theories versus a regular person's theory. Um, you need to understand the difference between them. And, you know, as far as evolution is concerned, we can debate this at a later point in science, and I'm sure that we will. Um, but as far, far as that's concerned, you know, I just want you to pay attention to what science thinks. If you disagree with the personal um, concepts involved, that's fine, but that's a matter of faith. And that's where science becomes limited. Science cannot approach the issues of faith because faith fundamentally does not start with observation like science does. You take um, things that you observe as evidence for your faith, but you're not actually observing the faith itself or the items of faith itself. And so science and faith are really two independent worlds. They don't really overlap. In history, scientists have tried to make them overlap or tried to um, reconcile one with the other, and you really can't because you can't test them. And so I don't believe that they should be combined, and I don't believe that one is a danger to the other. But, you know, you may have a differing opinion, and that's why science is such a controversial topic. It always will be. It always is. And many times it takes years, if not hundreds of years, for certain scientific principles to be accepted. Um, and so it's just one of those things. It's, it's the nature of the beast. And so remember the basics of the scientific method. Remember what a theory is, what a law is, according to science. And, you know, just go on with yourself because as far as whatever gives you faith and hope and happiness and, you know, a moral compass, fantastic, go with it. Um, that's not what science is for. Science is, see that? So did I. Back to you, Bob. Okay, so um, off my little soapbox, and that's going to conclude part two of the first lecture. Uh, introduction to biology. If you have any questions, by all means, please see me during office hours, email me or call me, and I'll be happy to help you out. Have a fantastic day.